Hello and welcome to a special edition of the Game Informer Show. I am your host for this one. My name is Ben Hansen. I'm joined by Mr. Matt Miller. Hey, hey, hey. The Destiny King himself, Matt Miller. I don't know about that. All right, well, we're joined by two actual Destiny Kings. That is true. I guess if you can call them that. Uh, we have Mark Noseworthy, who's the executive producer of Destiny the Taken King. Hello. Welcome, Mark. And Mark is sitting next to Luke Smith over at Bungie, who's the creative director for The Taken King. Did you, you open with a hey, 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 like a Fat Albert reference from the 80s? <laughs> well, because do I have to do like a mushmouth impression or something? Man? I like that's that right. too. I think you're that, naturally doing a mushmouth impression, Luke. I think that's the way that works. Yeah, yeah. We, I love it. I think uh, I, I, I it's just, <laughs> it should be more yeah, relevant to the kids I today. I thought that was going to go, was it? I feel like I feel like there should be more Fat Albert references in uh, modern parlance. Absolutely. In modern gaming and all, Miller. Yeah. I agree completely. How has there not been a Fat Albert game? <laughs> I'm sure one came out in XBLA four years ago and just no one paid attention to it. <laughs> Anyways. Do you guys, I think the most important question we have to ask you is if you guys are making a Fat Albert game. <laughs> we really didn't want to talk about that today or reveal anything about our plans, but you know, now that you got us on the hook. Yeah. yeah. Destiny 2 colon Fat, Fat Albert. Albert. <laughs> All right. So well, this podcast. What we're actually talking about. Yeah. We have a ton of questions from the community, from Destiny fans all over the world who have been paying attention to the Gameformer's coverage and what Bungie has been saying about the Taken King. But yeah. believe it or not, you guys over there at Bungie are making a really complicated thing, and there are a thousand nitty-gritty questions that people have about the upcoming release. So we want to kind of run down some rapid-fire questions from the community and see how many you can answer here. Yeah, I mean... We, we already did 104 really rapid-fire questions. Yeah, that was I just know. us, man. When you hive mind this thing, it's all over the place. What, what people don't know about that story is... That, and Mark, you were in that, at, in that room as well, and I was as well. Like, Luke and Ben were doing those questions back and forth, and we were over in the corner just trying not to crack up. Yeah, and it was it was tough. So we posted this video where we asked uh, Luke 104 questions about Destiny the Taken King. Technically, it was more like 115, but a lot of them were just stupid. Too stupid to air beyond the stupid stuff that's already in there. But also, it sucked because the funniest stuff, objectively, was Luke making fun of Ben Reeves during that video for taking forever to ask those questions. Yeah, yeah like, where's the deleted scenes for that? I was like, I thought that was going to be gold. No, it was, it was tough because... The video is six minutes, right? But like, it took like forty-five minutes. Yeah, like, it took a long time. time. And a lot of it was Ben Reeves just marathon. staring at his lap, trying to chamber the next question in his head. It sucked because yeah. it was the funniest stuff. But in order to convey that, you had to pad it out and it would slow it down so much. Sorry, yeah. Luke. I cut your comedy gold, man. That's well, okay. Just as long as the world knows there was, there's more. There's the deleted scenes. That's right. Luke's <laughs> but, uh, a thousand times funnier than you could ever imagine. <laughs> well. For the sake of, of the questions that we pulled today, uh, we went through, we, you guys had, a, you like Destiny community folks, had a lot of questions, uh, as, and, and that's great. I mean, we've seen a lot of enthusiasm from both the Game Informer community and from the broader Destiny community about our coverage, and we were really thrilled to see so many people wanting to like know yet more about the game. And because of that, rather than doing what we sometimes do where we're like calling out a, a specific people's names and questions and reading them ver verbatim, there were so many things that were kind of repeated that uh, we wanted to uh, you know, kind of combine those and just get to those. So we'll start out with what for me was a weird thing to be the most popular question, but I think it was as I went through all of the different pages and pages of comments, a lot of people wanted to know what was up, what is up with etheric light once the Taken King launches. Is that something you guys can talk to us about? It's certainly something that, that we've gotten a lot of questions about too. And, and right now, as of uh, the end of August, there's 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 not currently a, an exchange for it, but I feel like that's a really good example of something that there's going to be such veracity for that that we're gonna we're gonna you know it's gonna be something we're gonna probably have to look at addressing because it is you know it is a a resource and in the past with those resources we have enabled a way for you to exchange them yeah. um, so so at the speaker or something like that so I would hope that yeah I would hope that people keep talking about that keep raising that issue and uh, we're gonna we're gonna get it looked at. Yeah, I'm, I'm this, it's one of the things that we, we had a video that went up on, on Wednesday that talked about this this uh, a lot with you guys is that I don't I don't think a lot of people out there understand how much you guys are like plugged in on on these communities and listening to the people who are playing your game. It's really great. Well, the, the catch, though, the catch with something like that, Miller, like with us saying that we're listening, like the, us saying that we're listening 
doesn't actually like it doesn't actually matter if Mark and I say that we're listening because the only way that the player experiences listening yeah. is when we react. Yeah. So just simply saying like we're listening, like if we do nothing, <laughs> then that 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 just that phrase that phrase loses its meaning. So I think that one of our one of our lessons from from last year is certainly you know we can continue to say that we're listening, but we have to we have to show people and react. And we've talked at length you know uh, this summer a little bit about. Uh, the quarterly balance patches and like more regularly updating the sandbox. And so we want to we want to not only continue to listen, say that we're listening, but uh, continue to show people and prove it by by reacting. Totally. Actions speak louder than words, right? Yeah. Sure. You said that way shorter and better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, how it is. <laughs> one of the other questions that popped up a bunch that that kind of cracked me up a little bit uh, because it, it indicates the way people are thinking about preparing to play this game is a lot of people want to know the very specifics of like when this game is launching. I don't mean like it's coming out on September 15th. They want to know like what time of day do I need to be not at work and not doing anything with my spouse <laughs> and not doing anything except for like being ready to turn the game on. When should people sit down on their couch? Yeah, we like we we have timelines like down to the minute that we're targeting and stuff, but uh -huh. the, they they change and they, they require like coordination with partners and the first parties and stuff in our data center and whatever. So like we, we don't really, we, it would be premature for us to announce something right now, but I, I'm sure when we get closer, um, you'll see something on, you know, our, our, our Twitter or the week, weekly update and say, Hey, the, you know, this is the earliest minute that you'll be able to play destiny. Got it. Um, so so you just think it'll be out there before, it, before it, it the could game change. Like it, honestly, we've talked about it changing a couple times in the last few weeks, right? Like, so I'm glad we haven't shared it yet. And the game itself is, is, is off to final certification as of yesterday. So now we're in this, we're in this like holding pattern where, you know, we're waiting, like sort of like not twiddling our thumbs, but sort of waiting with, you know, our hands clasped and waiting to see if it gets through cert. And that'll allow us to, you know, then to begin to work on or begin to prepare the, the initial series of updates we want to make to it. Uh, right. But that, that certification status, like which we expect it to go through and to be great, uh, if something were to happen, it, we, you know, we might need, that might change the hour at which the game becomes available. Gotcha. What are you guys doing now? Are you just uh, catching up on sleep? Is it? Nope. Um, uh, pacing. Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, uh, uh, starving myself, um, drinking too much caffeine, and uh, reading too much internet. That's the, uh, <laughs> we, you know, we're, we're doing. We're we're talking to the you know the media. We're talking to uh, players in our community. Yeah. We're still playing the game. Like we're, um, you know, Destiny's a game we're going to be working on for a long time, and, and we believe we've accomplished something pretty pretty great with the Taken King. But we're still looking at like. Um, you know how we're going to update it in the fall, and what we're going to do beyond that, and, and working on those plans, and even even in the next year. So there's no rest for the wicked, right? Um, but uh, it's a it's it's a yeah, it's a challenging time because like we want to just play the game, we want everyone to have it, um, and uh, at the same time we're trying to look forward at the future, and like balancing those things is is pretty hard. Like, and emotionally, it's just like it's really taxing, and um, it'll be great for the game to just get out and. Uh, be able to move forward. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, um, yeah, like no one has really, I mean, for me at least, like I, no one really prepared prepared me for what this period was going to feel like where the moment where, you know, you actually are powerless to make an immediate change in, in, in a period where we've had this extended period with this with this game that, you know, we're, we all really, really care about where we've been able to make a bunch of changes and suddenly we can't. And now we've got a bunch of, like, we have a bunch of media stuff to do. We have to switch into this other phase almost immediately of, like, answering questions and, and helping people understand the game that they're going to get this fall. And all of these things, like, these things all pile up in a, in, in a way that that can be pretty that can be pretty stressful and intense because you have this thing that you you care a lot about and you've put a bunch of your guts behind and the the whole team here has done that and we're all just sort of waiting to see to see how people are going to react to it and we're we're optimistic but you know uh, we're hopeful. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I think one of the things that I was interested to have uh, you guys kind of talk about that came up as a question in these these comments threads. Uh, it was something that, Luke, when you and I were talking during the visit, you were able to kind of um, offer your own reflections about. And in our cover story, you know, you're always having to balance what you can squeeze into the space that you have. And it, was, it wasn't something that I, I had the space, honestly, to, to, to be able to offer some of this cool insight that you had regarding um, how you guys think about the new light cap, right? There's a lot of people out there who are, are used to the game having this idea where you're going to, like, 
well, this is the cap, the light cap or the the uh, light cap for your, your chest piece and for your head piece. And that's as high as it, it's going. And that's the target you're shooting for. Um, and I'm curious if, if you, Luke, or, or Mark, if you have insights as well about like how that's a little bit different now, because I think a lot of people are just looking for that straight answer. Yeah, well, one of the one of the catches was the way that the conflation of the gear and the character level happened in the the D14 content. Uh, your identity became uh, became the, uh, the number over your head. That's that. Let's accept that that's your identity in Destiny currently, yeah. uh, and then that number was something that was out of your control as a player. Like this, I've, I've talked about this a little bit in the summer. I I don't recall if it was in the piece or not, but the most important piece of gear for the first three months of the game was the raid boots. Because if you mm -hmm. didn't get raid boots, you'd be forever 29. Um, and so when, when we split those two things out into light and character level, we also made a really conscious decision that the only number we would put over your head is your character level. Because that's earned deterministically. It's earned by, it's earned just by playing the game, by shooting monsters in a, in a very like conventional you know, RPG sort of manner. We then would introduce light or power or whatever, which is going to be the th the three digit number that represents sort of to it represents what you're what you're eligible to do. And as you as you find better gear, you can sort of do more challenging activities. Uh, in in the with respect to some sort of a, a capping mechanic, I don't I don't I don't know that we want players to think about the the capping mechanic in the same way. We want them to think about the activity that they're trying to get into and the reward and be excited about the rewards they're going to get from it. I realize that that's a little I mean that might be that might come across as a little a little hopeful or a little naive, but like when you have the nightfall in front of you at 280 and you're like 273, you know, we hope that we hope that 273 to 280 is fun and we hope that when you get to 274 from 273, it doesn't feel like you just went up a step of power. Like that was another one of the things that we're trying Trying to to soften the way that you experience power, but instead create a series of mounds for you to climb as you're moving through the moving through the game. And those mounds are dictated back to the player by the light recommended for the the given activity. Yeah. Like it, it was so digital before, right? The difference between 33 and 34 is like 30 plus percent damage. It's like, huge. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's huge and it, it's material and and. Uh, that, that's a real barrier for a lot of people, especially for people playing together. Like one of our goals has always been to, you know, be a game that's compatible with real life, to be able to keep friends together. And when the difference between two levels, like two light levels, oh, sorry, well, one light level is that pronounced, like you suddenly don't even want to play with your brother anymore. You're like, sorry, man, you can't come with Skolas around with us. And oh, and you don't have Galahorn, like, fuck off, right? And that's, that's, that's just not ideal for like a thriving community. And so now it's a, it's a lot more analog. and. And, and because even in a world where light is still attached to weapons and drops and those drop in the game, many of those, you know, randomly, like RNG is still there, I, it, it still feels in The Taken King that it's a little bit more in your control, right? Like I can go on and log in one night and, and play the daily and play a couple other activities and maybe I started at like 265 and by the end of the night I'm like 269, right? Uh, maybe I played, not, you know, 90 minutes or something, but I made progress. Um, and. Uh, and whereas in the past, like I might have had to play like 20, 30 hours and maybe get that drop, maybe not, right? Right. And so by by doing this, it it allows us to drop more drop more loot, have more things for players to chase and find in the world, and to be making more like incremental progress, like you know, um, every night that I log in. And uh, I find it just yeah, I find it more rewarding. If if we were to separate the if we were to separate acquisition into and do a couple of a couple of conversational elements where uh, you know power is one of them, and let's just like call the other one you know optimization. Um, power is the simple function of making yourself damage in, damage out, effective for the purpose of of, of my definition here. And um, the other the other thing I said optimization is about aligning and having an excellent kit. And so some examples of that would be like finding an artifact if you're a night stalker hunter that has you know, triggers orbs on void grenade and finding boots that increase agility with void double kills or, you know, like looking for those, looking for those things to optimize. So now let's address them separately. The first thing with vertical power is that uh, the Dest in Destiny 1, the vertical power game was really long. It took you, it took you, you know, 50, 60 hours of gameplay and of sort of doing a bunch of the same activities just to get powerful enough to get into the raid. So you had this long vertical climb to become powerful. Then you had this the horizontal in this case of finding raid gear that had the right talents, etc. Well, in, in Destiny One last year and in the uh, in the fall game, 
it just was the raid gear. The raid gear didn't have any any variety on it, so you just were hoping for a drop. When you got the drop, you were done, and, and suddenly that was less interesting to you. So looking forward and, and, and looking into this fall, what we wanted to do was actually lessen the climb vertically. We wanted it to take less time for you to get to power effectiveness. And we wanted it to take, we still wanted it to be a journey and still wanted it to be exciting to you to try to find the perfect piece of gear. But in order to find something like the perfect piece of gear, what that means that our job is to do is to introduce, like make sure that you get more gear more frequently to choose from and make sure that there's more variety on that gear. So you truly feel like if you want to tinker and you want to have, you know, customization of your intellect discipline stats, we want to give you a better way to look at that. So we have the new, the new tier system, you know, but vertically that vertical progression of like, Hey man, I just like, I just like, I just got this game. I want to, I want to get into the, I want to get into the raid or I want to get to the daily or I want to get to nightfall. We wanted to take those, that, that time to, to acquiring, to acquiring power and, and lessen that frankly. Yeah, that's cool. That's that's uh, some great insights. Um, before we get off the topic of of light, I think one of the other things, and I've seen this myself in some uh, some community threads, um, and uh, and it showed up in some of the questions people were asking about. They want to. I, I think people are still wanting to understand how this kind of averaging system works with with the light specifically. There there's questions about whether um, the attack value of a given weapon uh, makes a difference to to its damage above and beyond its value for increasing your light. And so yes. like- I mean, the, the short answer, dude, is yes. Okay. Like the, the attack value exists on the weapons yep. to dictate the attack value for the weapon. So a weapon that is 100, 170 attack Mm -hmm. um, will drop your light by some percentage if your average light's 280. Right. I've seen like I've seen the same thing you're talking about. Um, and, and what that's going to do is lower your overall your 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 uh, you're going to be less defensive. Like you're going to you're going to you're going to receive more damage because your overall overall light went down. Yep. But when wielding that 170 attack weapon, your attack is also going to go down too because the weapon's not scaling against the the inflation curve for the enemies. Got it. So it's all it's all very it's all very specific, very intentional. If uh, the the attack values definitely play a huge part in the the amount of damage a, a weapon can deal. Got it. Um, uh, a lot of people were asking. You know, last week there was the the big reveal on the live stream about uh, vault space. You know, double weapons, double armor, lots more space for people to to kind of store stuff. Um, the last time there was kind of an expansion. There was a lot of discussion about how the, the connections to memory limitations on old gen systems, uh, and we had a few people who were curious just about like what enabled this this um, this big adjustment. I think a lot of people are really happy that it's moved up to to be so much larger than it was, um, but what what kind of went down there that that uh, enabled you to get, to be able to offer that to to players at this point. Yeah, it was actually a pretty late breaking thing. Um, like we, we wanted, yeah, to yeah, it wasn't there when we were. It wasn't, right? wasn't there a month ago when you yeah. guys played, and and uh, I think we were being pretty cagey about it then because we wanted to find some miracle, but uh, we we couldn't at the time. And it really comes down to memory and memory management, which is like this super unsexy, uninteresting part of game development. But um, at the end of the day, like the consoles have fixed amounts of of memory, and how you allocate that memory and to what. Um, you make these decisions in development, and then you stick to these budgets, and when things go over budget, the game reacts in certain ways, and we establish budgets to, to launch, and we've been managing them in the live game for a while. Um, and it's sort of like uh, uh, it's sort of like mining. You know, guys are down in the hole, and they're digging, and they're digging, and they're digging, and then they find something, they come up, and like, hey, I found a little gem, and you're like, okay, well, that's not very good, but thanks anyways, throw it, throw it in the bucket. And then one day, somebody strikes gold, and then they find something uh, that is material. And uh, we were lucky enough that that happened. We like found a megabyte of memory, which doesn't sound like a much, um, but it's a big deal to an action game. Uh, and at that point we realized, okay, well, how do we want to allocate this? And of course, everyone came to the table with their forks and their knives and they had you know open <laughs> mouths. And we decided like, well, the first thing that's gonna get fed is gonna be the vault because it means the most to the most number of players. So is it really tough? To, is it tough to keep stringing those old consoles along, along at this point? Destiny, I mean, Destiny working as well as it does on four platforms is a, just like a testament to the engineering team. Just like the story that that Mark told, like the uh, those guys have done those guys have done amazing work. And when you check the game out on PS3 or 360, like that that we're getting we're getting out of that hardware. What we are is is awesome. Like we have a, a sweet engineering team, and the engineering team like basically turned 
turn water into wine to get to, to there to be vault space. Like it's fantastic. Like Mark said the word miracle and it basically, I mean, it basically, you know, in, in game development terms was one. <laughs> That's yeah. Like crazy. Pr prior to finding the memory to do this, we actually were increasing the vault space by only three spots. Yeah, that's all, that's, all, that's all we had. And we're like, can we even roll out three extra spots? Like, <laughs> were we going to mention this in the patch notes? We're like, I don't think so. Like, we can't, oh. we can't boast. We can't boast about that, you know. Right. Um, and so we, you know, we were looking for solutions, and uh, you know, luckily we found one at the end, and yeah, we're happy about it. That's cool. Um, I have a, uh, I have a certain perspective on this next question because when I came to visit, the primary character I played was my Titan, uh, and. And uh, I got to play around with that that awesome hammer. But a lot of people, and I mean a lot of people, were asked in the comments threads were asking about um, Titan power, uh, specifically people going in uh, and and being unhappy about uh, their power levels as a, as a Titan, uh, feeling like they've they've had a rough go of things, and that the other classes have some some pretty distinct advantages. Um, and, we, you know, to be fair, we didn't see a lot of this for, you know, everybody complains about their class and wants it to be more powerful. But I, I did not see a lot of this from, from folks like Warlocks and, um, and Hunters writing in. So I guess my question to you guys is, do you think that that's, um, do you agree? Do you, do you feel like the Titans need a little bit of a bump where, from where they are right now? Or do you not? You think that that's kind of just um, bull? Um, and uh, what's your take on, on Titans with Taken King? So the, I, the first thing I'm going to say is, no, we don't think it's bull. Yeah. That's like, that's like a, you know, like we want, we, we actually do want to continue to have that dialogue with the fans. Like, I, I think that a well-played Defender Titan is still the strongest PvE class in Destiny. Like, I still believe that that is, the, that is the, a strong PvE class. Like, the kit is, the kit could could definitely be should be stronger. The original six kits, we could make. You know, we've got to look at all of those things in our in our upcoming balance patches. Yeah. But I still think the Defender Titan is like probably one of the is the strongest PVE class. Now, let's look at PVP for the Defender Titan. Though, like here's an example of a of an anecdote that I I'm pretty sure frustrates players. You know, I I put down my bubble and I'm on the control point and the Blade Dancer Hunter like rolls up. He doesn't even come into my bubble. He just throws razor to, razor's edge, goes through the bubble and kills me in my own home. <laughs> uh, yes, that's like that's really frustrating. Um, I would want to dig up the patch notes, but I'm I, I I believe that we're addressing that in the 2.0 update. We're not we're not talking about that too much. But like to your meta question though, which is really about Titans and class balance, like the that, that like we need to look at all of the original six moving forward and, and looking at these new kits that we have for the uh, the Sunbreaker, Night Stalker, and the Stormcaller. Like those those kits are all pretty impressive and have have some new gameplay and represent the our evolving thinking. And we've got to go back and look at and look at some of those older classes and and see what's going on. Mark Mark was the producer for the Sandbox team, so he can he has a lot of insight into where the where the Titan originated from. You were telling a story about this last night. Yeah, it's funny that, you know, there's this Titan inferiority complex out there because when we originally started, you know, building all the abilities for the game, the Fist of Havoc was the first super that really felt great. Like, and it was the super by which we judged all other supers in the game. Like, it would be like, why would anyone play as this thing when you could just Fist of Havoc dudes, right? <laughs> or you could, you know, death from above in the air. And it, it just, it felt so good and it was, you know, pretty pretty murderous, and so it was the the first super that was we really thought nailed like the expression of power um, and that 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 really strong feeling. And then of course, then we tried to balance other things against it. Um, uh, you know, golden gun and 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 uh, the the void powers and stuff. So um, yeah, but it, balance is an ongoing thing, and um, we're certainly not ignorant to it. And like we've mentioned this numerous times, it's probably getting old at this point, but. Like we play the game, like we play the hell out of the game, and there are people here who play as titans and also think that the titans are underrepresented, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, and hopefully you experience this yourself, Matt. Like when you played as the Sunbreaker, like he's awesome. Yeah. Like he he feels really good, you know. Yeah. And uh, it's a it's a different fantasy than than playing the other subclasses. And I, I think there's uh, there's a bit of uh, like the fantasy of, of playing as a Titan, as a, a defender, or you know, as, as using um, Fist of Havoc, maybe isn't as sexy as being a warlock or being a hunter. But as soon as you put Sunbreaker up against those, 
um, I think he kind of starts moving to the front of the pack. Uh, and, you know, you know, all stats aside, people start feeling pretty good about being, uh, you know, a sunbreaker. So, yeah, I mean, just speaking for, from the experience that I had, that sunbreaker run, running around with him in those moments when a big crowd of enemies would show up and you could you could tap that super button and you brandish your hammer and you hear the distant sound of the hammer hitting the forge. I mean, it's yeah, that is a power fantasy and a potent one at that. <laughs> that you didn't know you wanted. No, I, I didn't. <laughs> and like it's it's a blast. I, I, I mean, everybody like you say, everybody's going to have their own opinions ab- about about uh, their own classes and that kind of stuff. But I'm I have to agree. I mean, I think a lot of a lot of people who maybe have felt that like they've been getting short shrift with their their Titan main. Um, I think have some pretty cool stuff to look forward to with this this new build. Yeah. In that, I mean, the, yeah, the, our, our sandbox seems amazing. You know, they they did an incredible work work for the project and delivering that delivering those class fantasies. Like the Sunbreaker has, you know, like Mark's watched me go on the journey through uh, through the three classes where yeah. I'm like, you know, six, you know, yeah, I, I wouldn't even say how long ago it was, but like at different points in the project, I'm like, Mark, you have to play Stormcaller. <laughs> He's blessed. He's chosen, yeah. and then like then like you know like around E three time frame, and I talked about it a lot, uh, a lot at E three man. I was playing a lot of Night Stalker. I love the Night Stalker. Yeah. I think the Night Stalker is a lot of fun. He speaks, you know, as a support player. The Night Stalker speaks into my wheelhouse. But as I've been playing at home this summer, I like I'm like coming to Mark, and I'm like, yo, I think this I've got a the Sunbreaker. He's blessed, and then I'm going th- going on the journey with each of the classes, just like you know, as a, as a player is going to. I think that they all have they all have some pretty cool strengths, powers in their kit, and that you know that's just our the, the Bungie Sandbox team, man. Those guys those guys do amazing stuff, and uh, we're we're really excited for players to get their hands on the new the new three subclasses uh, in September, and then tell us like, okay, well, here's here's you know, stoke the forge of ideas on on how how we can make the other ones better. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I mentioned early on that, that the most popular question had to do with etheric light. Um, the most popular topic, however, was about exotics. And I know, you know, from having talked with you guys before, that you kind of opened the doors on certain aspects of exotic uh, weapons and armor. Um, and there's other things that you guys really want to, like, keep sacred, right? Like, keep reserved for the people who are going to kind of discover some of that stuff as... Uh, as they they play the game, and so I know there's there's something there were some questions that I came across that that I know you guys are just you know you, you can't answer right now, but I did want to ask you about um, kind of what guided your decisions about you know there's this pro- this idea of these year one exotics that are moving forward and becoming year two exotics, and what you guys were kind of looking for uh, as, as you decide which weapons should should be a, kind of a central part of year two. Which ones are we going to kind of put this focus on alongside this this new batch of really awesome exotic uh, weapons and armor that some of which we got to play with and, and were really cool? It, it, I, there's a lot of complexity to that question. Yeah. So the the first thing that I, that I'll say about it, and I'm I'm sure Mark's going to jump in at, at, at points along the way too, is that it is you know it's like a it's like a team wide discussion about you know, what exotics are, are the ones that we want to look at to, to bring forward in September? You know, what are the exotics that, you know, and it, it, like what are the exotics that are going to be, uh, that are going to like fit into the, the version of the metagame that we want to look at? Like what are some things that, you know, we want to see, we want to see slip by the wayside? What are things that we want to shine a light on? What are things that, you know, for the weapons, like what are, what are some of our new exotic archetypes? Like, you know, if we, if we have three, like we have something like three brand new, exotic scout rifles like you know we like so when we're looking at the the blow in an in an archetype we don't want to have you know we don't want to have the exotic library say like did you bring did you bring a scout did you bring a scout rifle do you like scout rifles well if you don't like scout rifles i got bad news for you so there's this <laughs> there's this like balance especially especially with the primaries um, you know, like looking at something like like Mida, and you know, I know that I know that Mida is not on that list. You know, uh, and that's that's something that's difficult. That's difficult for people who love Mida multi tool. You know, I love Mida multi tool. <laughs> <laughs> you can change this, Mark. It's not too late. <laughs> and, and and you know, when you look at the like, there. I'm trying to think. I don't want to. Uh, I I don't believe there's a new pulse rifle exotic. So there's not a new. There's not a brand new I pulse think, rifle. I think so, there 
I think there's one that we talked about in our story, right? Isn't there? Oh, yeah. No, yeah, you're right. The, there is. There's one new exotic pulse rifle. Yeah, which um, was awesome, by the way, for the yeah, record. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really cool weapon. But we didn't want to leave pulse rifles thin. So then you're like, okay, well, you know, bad juju and, and, and red death. Like, we, let's, let's, bring those guys, let's bring those guys forward. You know, we had to do something with the, the holy trinity of hand cannons. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the thorn, last word, hawk wound. Yeah. And, you know, and then you have to then, like, throw, throw onto the scales with that as well. Like, these, these, we have this whole, like, community of players on Xbox who have never got to fire a hawk moon and never got to play with the fourth horseman and so we were like well those are like obvious like those those felt obvious to us to bring you know hawk moon monte carlo and the fourth horseman ahead for year two so that everyone regardless of platform can have these experiences with these with these these cool weapons um but yeah some stuff does get left behind and some stuff like your you know your icebreakers like that that's a gun that is is probably even too good uh it's 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 just too good of a weapon it doesn't force you to engage with the game and icebreaker and galahorn to me are these like really interesting metaphors for the type of game we shipped last year where you know uh, Galhorn and Icebreaker were solutions, uh, like solutions to to problems, and those problems are things like you know bullet sponginess or you know Nightfall's punishing kicking me to orbit, so it's incentivizing me to you know sit behind cover and not die because the death penalty is so high. And when we're when we're talking about how we want to improve the game, you know, like we've talked about, we don't want the bosses to feel like bullet sponges because when they do, the the player symptom is well, Galhorn's the answer to everything, and we don't want any of the exotics to be the answer to everything. We want them to be situational useful you know we want you to have the moment where you're like oh my god the gun that would be perfect for this is blah and so so, so that's like a bunch of all of those things on the pve side are a big part of what inform those what inform those discussions and then throw the monkey wrench into the whole equation which is like now let's talk about the pvp metagame and so in our power enabled playlists for for pvp uh you know the the power enabled areas of the game you know like our banner and, and our trials of osiris you know what are the like how do we want to shift the metagame around in that area too so that you know aspirationally you know and i hope that we i hope that we achieve it and if we if we don't i know that i know we're going to hear from our, our fans about it like we do want this fall to feel like a different season and part of it feeling like a different season is that a bunch of those weapons and, and pieces of armor that have been there they're, they're not there in september yeah oh cool so we have some more questions for you we're running out of time but we're gonna blast through all these but um, some of these other questions were a little bit we started with some of the top level kind of philosophy ideas a few of these other ones i think are a little bit more kind of i don't know straightforward maybe yeah but we'll see <laughs> maybe maybe we'll, we'll, we'll surprise ourselves yeah, 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 yeah okay like, why don't you ask the questions and we'll tell you how good they are <laughs> yeah i can't love it. wait all right are there any thoughts on the possibility of raising the glimmer cap next uh, all right some commenters are worried about running out of money especially as they buy new things for all their alts and they don't want to have to grind for money so is, is there anything you can say on that front yeah, we haven't we haven't talked about about raising the glimmer cap. We certainly have looked at the incoming and outgoing outgoing uh, uses for glimmer. We found that you know data wise, players tend to have quite a bit on them often. So um, we haven't. Yeah, in fact, I think we've not done our we've not actually rewarded you enough glimmer. We've not we've not rewarded enough glimmer, and we haven't we haven't charged you enough for stuff. We haven't given you enough stuff to do with it. That's so you, you I guess it, to put that another way, maybe it sounds like you're saying that there's there are potentially more opportunities to get more glimmer but also more opportunities to spend glimmer hopefully yes like arms oh, that's day, what you're aiming example. for Sorry. anyway like the game's coming out in like two and a half weeks i, don't, I just can tell it like arms day as you rank up with arms day you can buy more packages yeah and so you're you're you know you're spending something like 2500 glimmer per arms day package and if you have three characters you're buying upwards of three a week so your your outgoing glimmer for these upgrades is you know nine by 25 so someone like someone can do the math on that like 2200 22,000 glimmer and change something like that yeah that's uh, a lot so you've got you've got stuff to spend it on, and now now we need to make sure that that we're that we're giving it an incoming rate. So an example of an economy change that we've made is that now patrols like pay out way more glimmer than they've ever paid out. Like mm. they they're a great source of glimmer. Like get out into the world, completing patrols gives you glimmer. Completing uh, some of the new types of patrols, some of the VIPs, they give you even more. When some uh, of the gear now have talents that like increase your glimmer drop, right? Like yep. That's like a pretty pretty common thing. Yep. Cool. So you're gonna have you're gonna have kits of gear where you're like, well, I'm gonna keep these around even though they're not the highest light on them because when I want some cash, bam, throw these on and just rake it in. I mean, you, there was even an exotic that was shown on Instagram yesterday for the warlock that 
is kind of about that, right? Yeah, the uh, I, I can't. I don't have the name in the forefront of my brain right now, but yeah, like uh, Destiny. Something and games to do with are, being an alchemist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, because someone asked me if it was a Dota reference, which uh, uh, actively it was not. But that's an that's a great coincidence. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, so readers would like to know more about artifacts and the artifact slot. Is there anything you can tell us about that? Uh, yeah, we uh, talked a little bit about this today on the stream. I've like tweeted about this a fair bit to try to like help people understand this more. The uh, artifacts are a new slot in Destiny. They are not displayed on the character. Like get that out of the way. They're much more like a, a ring or a jewelry slot um, in, in some other in some other games where you're not gonna you're not gonna actually see it. But they fulfill a pretty interesting niche where they are a place where all the typically all the talents on the uh, on the artifact slot in addition to sort of allowing you to pick um, what what stats you want to bias toward in uh, strength or discipline. They also have a, a, an additional way for you to generate an orb that's usually uh, elemental based. So like, you know, getting precision kills with an elemental weapon and it'll save void solar arc. Same thing with your getting melee kills and same thing with grenades. So it sort of becomes a way for you to look for look for a little something, a little a little something something to, to create a few extra orbs for your for your teammates. Gotcha. Artifacts also, they, they unlock at 40. Yeah. So it, it's not until you hit the character level cap that that you actually can get and equip your first artifact, right? And it's part of that transition to the, really, to the true end game. Do they still have that kind of like transition for even though they're they're capped, and you have to be at forty? Can you still get like white, green, blue, purple artifacts? Uh, the, or are the they artifacts all... only come in in rare and legendary quality? Got it. So, uh, like, there's there's like a when you hit yeah. It's funny, like this is one of those like little things where I could tell you exactly how you get your first one, and it, it might sound cool or it might not sound cool, but like the game's gonna get you one. Yeah, uh, the game's gonna get you your first one. Cool, gotcha. So it turns out a lot of people don't like the way that they look, uh, and they're wondering if with the Taken in the King, game. Uh, well, who knows? Or, it could be broad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if in the Taken King they'll have a chance to change or add facial hair or change the hairstyles or just change their doll, as you call them. Uh, what do you think, He Man? Uh, we, something many people, including myself, are quite passionate about. I, I, I mentioned last week that I created a, my character looked like Prince Adam. There's a bit more of a story behind that, actually. Like, so uh, I liked He Man as a child a lot, and really, what I wanted to look like, I wanted to be Faker. Faker is like the robot He Man, yeah, that yeah. Like Skeletor oh, controls God. or whatever. He's, he's blue skinned, has like a robot chest. Oh, the coolest guy, yeah. And, and he's like really hard to get the collector's item and like. I, uh, you know, I have one at home on my, on my desk. He's sweet. So I wanted to look like Faker, and so I went Awoken. The problem is Awoken doesn't have like the cool human haircut, so I had to get like Did you say the cool yeah, human yeah, haircut. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Should just say that. And so then I had to go like human, and then I was like, well, I can't. I guess I'm more Prince Adam because like he man is supposed to be like his chest showing and a sword and everything. So so I went Adam, and, and I thought that'd be cool, uh, and it was cool for a little while. But now I'm like, I really need to change. <laughs> my clothes and my haircut and like I'm just not I'm not feeling it but uh, the the set the the unfortunate and true answer is like at, when Taken King comes out there's there's no barbershop um, uh, but it is something there's something that we talk about and uh, there are a lot of people including myself who are very passionate about being able to you know um, make visual changes uh, to their character that are you know not stat bearing in any way. So I'm and I'm I'm colorblind guys and so when I was setting up and creating my characters. Uh, Emmy Chung, who's uh, who's uh, the one of the lead designers on on last year's game, and also now she's the the director for the live game. I was texting her when I was doing character creation, my characters, and asking her to tell me if the colors made sense. I, I'm like, I'm going for you know brown hair. It's like, is this the right color? Like, what color do you think my eyes are? Because I just can't. I couldn't tell. So <laughs> creepy my, messages to I receive. Put time into it, and I'm excited about my characters. I think they all look great. Yes. But I would love to turn my lady titan into a into a male titan because he got them the big the big shoulder pads look awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It'd be nice to have a little barbershop asteroid or something with the barber pole on it. You just swing by for well, a little quick stop. Or bar barbershop slash sex change. There we uh, go, doctor. Apparently, yeah. but you Just guys character recustomization is the um, the the neutral and, and, and great way of describing that. Yeah. <laughs> but as long as you guys acknowledge that fans would like to alter that at some point, see, they're not the only ones who'd like to alter. Okay, it. <laughs> perfect. So uh, some fans are also wondering: Is there still any value in continuing to play the old raids? Are you going to be actively steering longtime players towards new content, or is there any chance you're going to be updating the old raids? 
Yeah, one of the core pillars for Destiny is this notion that we wanted to create a game that's compatible with real life. So when you're looking at progression content, like progression content isn't something that you want to continue to unfold layers of it on top of players. Like if we if we turned up the activity level on every activity in the game where you always had a bunch of stuff to do every week, that really quickly can get to the place where it's, yeah, the, the, the burden of logging in every day it is too great. And that, that violation of the compatibility of real life is why we're, in fact, steering people toward, yeah, people are going to, the progression content comes from King's Fall this fall. Um, with respect to the initial part of the question, uh, the value, the value in, in a bunch of that content is the, the intrinsic value of, of playing it. It's, it's still, it's still fun and it's still like a cool place to around and go to, but it's not, uh, not in September a part of your, a part of your, your progression chase. Okay. Yeah, the year one gear still drops there, so if you're a collector and you like really want to get into the class or whatever, you can, it, there's, there's still that value in, in playing it as well. So a lot of people also wanted to know if there are any new trophies or achievements in the Taken King. Yes. There are. Okay. Most importantly, then, can players still attain the valorous, <laughs> valorous and notorious trophy slash achievements since the Crucible and Vanguard marks are going away? Yeah, I believe. So I checked in with a test team recently because I was getting some tweets about this. And uh, it is either that you can still get the achievements, but through legendary marks, or that we change the achievements to work through legendary marks. So either way, nobody's getting screwed. Um, cool. Those, those achievements, yeah. People can continue. Like someone who buys a legendary edition, never played Destiny. Uh, and they want to get all the achievements we've ever released can still get that achievement. That will be welcome news to many people. Yes, otherwise I think you would have heard something from your community. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people are wondering how equipping emotes work. Just like equipping any other item in the game, you go down to the inventory screen and you select the item and you press X or square or whatever. And Slow then... down, hang on. <laughs> Miller, did you get more into this question? Well, I think people were curious about just like, because there's different slots, right? Uh, so are you actually setting them to each of the D-pad slots and you've got four options? Is that For, for, se for September, the uh, the uh, only slot that you're consuming with the most is the left directional pad, pad which is the point slot. Got it. And right. otherwise, otherwise the, the up, right, and down are, are relatively consistent. Yep. Got it. Cool. What's happening in the reef during the Taken King? Is there anything new with Petra as a character or an avenue to quests? Yep. Petra has uh, her own uh, storyline. It opens up pretty early for you. It's a long, it's a long adventure hmm. that she's going to take you on, and um, you're going to kind of be learning through the eyes of the Awoken, like their reaction to. Yeah, their the, yeah their reaction to the to the presence of the Taken King. Yeah, because like we haven't talked a lot uh, anything about it because uh, you know we don't want to spoil anything. But there's some some big stuff in the in the opening about uh, you know the Awoken and and Oryx and all that kind of stuff. So it makes sense that there would be something with Petra kind of following through on that, right? Yep, and she, there is a storyline with um, with her and Varix that that emerges you know later later into the game and. Uh, there's this cool moment in it that I will I will just I will spoil for you where uh, you're you're doing a you're doing a, a quest activity you know new mission and um, Varix is talking to you and Petra ch chimes up chimes in and for this like, just gives you this feeling of like oh my gosh like this feels like the continuation of the the DLC two storyline and uh, it's it's a pretty cool moment man and that and, and the only way we can have moments like that in Destiny is when we when we do what we've we've really tried the teams really tried to make an effort for in the Taken King which is you know having those characters that you're excited to hear from or you recognize hearing from them and then giving them giving them motivations and then grinding those motivations with you the player and you know that there's you know it, it's all really it's all it's all basic stuff that you know we didn't meet our potential we didn't meet our potential last year for doing and, and we're trying to get better at it this year and I think that's another another example of these these characters like coming to life and you know feeling a little cooler as you run around the world. Uh, so people are also wondering if there are any new rewards for the Prison of Elders and Trials of Osiris for the Taken King and if, if you're going to keep the rewards competitive with year two gear. Uh, well, the Prison of Elders is, uh, is is an example of like it's you know the the way that I described the the raids earlier like the you know it's like the we're not going to add extra things to to players so that the game can no longer be compatible with real life. Trials of Osiris is a little bit different. Uh, when when Trials of Osiris returns, it will be with with better uh, year two appropriate rewards. Uh, that is that is that is a, an area of the that's a ritual that we're really excited about and want to want to preserve. Cool. Uh, we oh Miller, go for it. Yeah, you know, I, with the little time we had left, I wanted to talk about um, 
you know, we, we talked some in our coverage about the strike playlist changes, uh, but I think there's some people out there who, who want some clarification about there, there's fewer playlists, right? Um, and, and how that, that all works together and how you guys are approaching that from a matchmaking perspective of, of making sure everybody kind of has the, a good strike playlist experience. Can you guys talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so one of the things in uh, D14 is the way that the uh, way the strike playlists work. Each strike has a level or a level associated with it, or a uh, an animal name. Um, you know, Ursa or Marmoset. I think were the ones that y'all saw. Yeah, yeah. Dragon and you know, uh, you know, whatever crow or whatever they're all named. Uh, what this does, though, when you have all those when you have all those animal names and you're ostensibly ki- clicking clicking, you know, uh, different numbers to go up, is it, it this didn't help feel like the game would this didn't help the game feel new uh, when you arrived at the sort of the orbit phase of the game or the end game as we've we've been calling it oftentimes so this was one of the places where we wanted to make a a, a pretty a pretty simple change uh, but a, a significant one to the player experience where there are now just going to be three three playlists uh, those playlists are legacy and legacy is all of the year one content, all the year one strikes so if you're a year one player you're going to be you're going to be messing around in legacy um, then, uh, there's Vanguard Normal and Vanguard Heroics, and that's where you're going to have the new the new Taken King experience. Those have the the light requirements of uh, something like I think it's you know 200 maybe something about 200 for the normal and 260 for the heroics. The heroics, uh, the Vanguard Heroic Strike replaced that that playlist replaces the existence of a weekly strike, and each week you'll uh, you'll be able to bang out some uh, weekly weekly strikes in the uh, in the heroic playlist for legendary marks as a way that we're uh, revising the end game. But the uh, that that playlist is also designed to be to be a place that you can go whenever you want just to to get a little bit more challenge. Now, if we did that and then we itemized it completely differently than the normal strikes, we could get into this case really quickly where players feel like they've got to play something that's hard for them or unfun to them. Uh, if they're, you know, lower thumb skill or like my, you know, my like childlike nieces, you know, are probably not not equipped to play the heroic version of the activities yet. So the normal strikes in the in Vanguard normals are still rewarding. They're still super fun, and they're going to continue to give you gear that is looking at your character sheet and finding stuff that's, you know, an upgrade for you. So it's not like you're going to only get, you know, power 200 gear from the normal strikes. If you're, you know, a 260 running around in the in the normal playlist, you're going to be matched with people around your level, and you're going to be uh, finding finding gear, you know, appropriate to you for power. It really is just about playing 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 the strikes the way that that, that you want to. Cool. Um, can you guys talk at all about about steps uh, that that the team is taking to to minimize or or eliminate issues with lagging players or cheaters in the crucible? Is that something you guys are exploring at all in Taking King? It, it absolutely it absolutely is something we're exploring, but uh, we're we're not rolling out. Uh, the results of those explorations in September because they're they're still ongoing and, and messing with networking is really difficult. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I don't know that we've talked about before is we we are rolling out a, a much tighter skill matchmaking system for for PvP. I don't know that Larzy and the boys have talked about that a whole lot yet, but we're we're definitely making strides to getting players better competitive games. That's really important to us, and that that that's where we're that's where we're addressing this fall. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Obviously, there are a lot of questions about the raid, uh, and I know you guys aren't exactly talking about it yet, but I'm wondering if you can just address the reasons you're not talking about it yet. Is it one of those things that you want to keep completely cryptic until the date launches, or what's your rollout plan for that? Yeah, I mean, everyone, uh, you know, rightfully rightfully so, wants to know about the raid. It's, it's obviously something that I, I'm excited about. I, I'm excited to, 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 to share it with the, the community. But things like that are best experienced by the whole at once, by the entity of the, the people playing the game. It's, it's really important to us that there's a, a real common ground for everyone to sort of enter the raid together and, and, and solve, that, solve that series of puzzles you know, as a group. It's one of those things that is really important to us uh, and, and really important to, to that experience. Sure. Since you were uh, on the raid team before, is this a raid that you designed, or is there a specific Taken King raid team now that worked on this one? They uh, every raid is like a, is a is a team effort. Um, 
the the raid team's done a done a great job with with all the raids, and I think King's Fall is is definitely showing. You know, the the raid team's aware of the expectations, and uh, they have they have a pretty big appetite. And uh, I, I think the, the 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 guys on the team have have really done a great job and have have created something that. Uh, while I'm not going to say anything specifically about it, I, I, I believe people will remember it for for a long time, and that's that's really all we ever hope for for the raids is that there are elements of it that you just are going to always remember, and they're gonna they're gonna stick with you. Well, before we finish up, I think we have we had one other question that I think is is probably maybe the most important thing that's ever been asked about about Destiny. Hi, Bar. Uh, so this is a joke question. <laughs> <laughs> that, Luke, master of comedy, you see what's coming. <laughs> well, I we had somebody who asked uh, about how guardians see through helmets that don't have eye holes. Do you, yeah, like the that's how's a that work? that's a really. Good question, because like imagining trying to look but through these this. Aren't, these aren't like medieval helmets. Well, like no, the like same. Like like, yeah, like Saint Saint Fourteen. That Saint Fourteen was the helmet yeah. I was going to use as an example. Like, do you see through the little Knight Rider slit? Like, I don't think so. No. Is it or like a like, one-way mirror? But, is I mean, isn't the real question about guardians like how do they use magic and stuff? Like, I mean, <laughs> that, that we're talking about like the practicality of the practicality of seeing out of a suit in a world where you're fighting like undead monsters, time traveling robots, giant warring like you know. Uh-huh. Boards or like, and, how, how do they use the bathroom when like, they're in a no, raid for three yeah, hours? I'm, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. The, the question is about, about eye holes. Yeah. Oh, it seems like it's breaking up. <laughs> <laughs> Great well, talk. So many secrets to yet reveal from the Bungie team. Well, there you go. We'll, we'll have to do without an answer to the eye hole question, guys. Um, but, uh, you know, listen, I, I wanted to take a second to, to thank you guys for, for having us out last month. Uh, and letting us come by and 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 talk to you guys and being so open to let us check out the game in advance of of you know when you guys were really totally done with it I I just I I think that it spoke a lot to the confidence you guys have in in how how cool this game is and how many big changes you guys are making to the the Destiny property that you guys were open to to opening the door to us and and letting us uh, letting us in to, to check things out so thank you for that. It was, it was, dude, it was completely our pleasure, man, that you guys were able to come in and check stuff out is, is so awesome for, for us and for you guys to share a bunch of information with the, you know, as evidenced by the questions that you've got, like the very voracious and perpetually hungry community that's looking for information on Destiny, uh, a game that I think, you know, we all on the call, you know, other than Ben, who's like not as into it as you are, Miller, but it's a game, it's a game that all of us on the call really, really care a lot about and, and care about, you know, uh, the way that our, the our fans do and so you know like mark and i have said a lot like we 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 want to make it better we're, we're going to keep trying to make make destiny better and keep keep pushing it closer to the potential uh that that it, that it has yeah definitely well thanks again to you guys and thanks again to the destiny community they've kicked the ass of so many other communities for our cover stories they are focused and like you said hungry. and enthusiastic yeah and unbelievably nice so thank you to everybody in the subreddit and all the different destiny websites and youtubers and stuff out there all right and thank you so much for tuning into this special edition of the game informer show be sure to tune in next thursday for another special edition where we'll be live streaming from the gamestop expo for something different but thank you so much for tuning in we hope you learned something and we'll see you next time see you later thanks guys